Good morning, everybody, and Tim, thank you for that introduction. It's a real pleasure and honour to be able to join you at uh, your uh, annual Australian Summit. This morning, I would like to discuss the narrow path that the Reserve Bank Board is seeking to navigate. That path is one in which inflation returns to target within a reasonable time frame, while the economy continues to grow, and we hold on to as many of the gains in the labour market as we possibly can. I think it is still possible to navigate this path, and it's certainly our ambition to do exactly that. But it's a narrow path, and it's likely to be a bumpy one, and there are risks on both sides, and I'll talk about some of those risks this morning. But really what I want to start off doing is to talk about the importance of the destination. That is a sustainable return of inflation to the target range. And I'd also like to talk about our strategy for getting to that destination, including yesterday's decision to increase the cash rate again. I'll then turn to some of the factors that the Reserve Bank Board will be considering as it navigates the return of inflation to the 2 to 3% target range. As you can see in this first chart, the recent inflation readings have been the highest in more than 30 years. I think the reasons for this are well known. They include the supply side disruptions caused by the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the very large fiscal and monetary stimulus that was delivered to support economies during the pandemic. And our job as Australia's central bank is to make sure that this period of high inflation is only temporary. And it's really important that we're successful here. High inflation is corrosive and it damages our economy. It erodes the value of money and people's savings. It puts pressure on household budgets and it makes life harder for businesses and it distorts investment. Inflation makes us all poorer and it hurts people on low incomes the most. And if inflation stays too high for too long, it will become ingrained in people's expectations and then the high inflation will be, become self-perpetuating. As the historical experience clearly demonstrates, the inevitable result of this would be even higher interest rates and at some point, a larger increase in unemployment to get rid of the ingrained inflation. And the board's priority is to do what it can to avoid this. As you would know, over recent times, the Australian economy has been operating at a very high level of capacity utilisation. You can see this in measures of capacity utilisation from surveys, which is shown in the top panel here. But it's also evident in the labour market, which has been very tight and recently the unemployment rate has been around the lowest it's been in 50 years. It's clear that the level of demand in the economy has been pushing up against the supply capacity of the economy and this has been contributing recently to the upward pressure on prices. And the return of inflation to target does require a more sustainable balance between aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the economy. And the tool that the RBA has to use to achieve this balance is interest rates. I acknowledge that this tool comes with some complications. Its effects are felt unevenly across the community and rising interest rates are causing significant financial pressures for some households. But this unevenness is not a reason to avoid using the tool that we have. It's certainly true that if the board had not lifted interest rates, some households would have avoided for a short period the financial pressures that come with higher mortgage rates. But this short-term gain would have been at a much higher medium-term cost. If we had not tightened monetary policy, the cost of living would be higher for longer. This would hurt all Australians and the functioning of our economy. This would ultimately require even higher interest rates to get inflation to come back down again and more unemployment. So as difficult as it is, the rise in interest rates has been necessary to bring inflation back to target within a reasonable time frame. The evidence suggests that the higher interest rates are working and that inflation is coming down. As uh, you can see in this chart, uh, 
in the March quarter, CPI peak, CPI inflation rate peaked at 7.8%, uh, um, and it's now coming down. Subsequent to the March quarter, the monthly CPI indicator showed a pickup in the 12-month ended inflation rate in April to 6.8%. This monthly outcome was a little higher than we had expected, but it has not changed the fundamental assessment that inflation is trending lower in Australia. As you can see in this next chart, uh, if we exclude volatile, the volatile items and the travel component of the CPI, inflation was 5.5% in six-month an annualised terms in April. That's uh, two percentage points lower than it was in um, October last year. So inflation is coming down. This decline in inflation is also evident in declining prices in global markets. As you can see here, oil prices have reversed much of the increase that followed Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the prices of many base metals have also declined, as have the prices of uh, many uh, food commodities in global markets, and you can see here the prices of wheat and beef have both come down. Similarly, the prices of international shipping has normalised after the spike uh, during the pandemic. Any time these lower shipping costs and lower commodity prices should be reflected in the prices that Australians pay for goods and services. But working in the other direction, services price inflation in Australia remains very high, rents are increasing quickly, and there'll be further large increases in electricity prices this year. In addition, unit labour costs are increasing briskly, an issue that I'm going to return to in a few moments. And these developments mean that it is too early to declare victory in the battle against inflation. The path back to 2 to 3% is likely to involve a couple of years of relatively slow growth in the economy, and we're likely to receive confirmation of that later this morning. Even so, as the board navigates the path back to 2 to 3%, it's seeking to preserve as many of the gains in the labour market as is possible to do. One of the unsung but very positive side effects of the, pandemics, of the pandemic was a once in a generation improvement in the Australian labour market. Over recent months, as you can see in this next chart, a higher sh share of Australians have had a job than ever before. And the youth unemployment rate has been the lowest it's been in many decades. There are very real and very tangible economic and social benefits to this. It's a significant achievement. And our ambition at the Reserve Bank is to return inflation to target while holding on to as many of these gains as is possible. I want to make it clear, though, that the desire to preserve the gains in the labour market does not mean that the board will tolerate higher inflation persisting. There is a limit to how long inflation can stay above the target range. The longer it stays there, the greater the risk that inflation expectations adjust, and the harder and the more costly it will be to get inflation back to target. If inflation stays high, this will damage our economy, and all Australians will feel the effects of this. Yesterday's decision to increase interest rates again was taken to provide greater confidence that inflation will return to target within a reasonable time frame. It follows recent information that suggested greater upside risk to the bank's inflation outlook. Services price inflation is proving persistent here and overseas, and the recent data on inflation, on wages and on housing prices were higher than we had factored into our forecasts. Given this shift in risks and the already fairly drawn out return of inflation to target, the board judged that a further increase in interest rates was warranted. In making this decision, the board had a very detailed discussion of the slowdown in household spending and the stresses that some households are under because of higher interest rates and higher rents. We understand that it's very difficult for many people at the moment. But the board also considered the cost for households and the economy of inflation staying too high for too long. It's in Australia's interest that we get on top of inflation and that we do so before too long. 
and the Board of the Reserve Bank will do what's necessary to achieve that outcome. As we make our decisions over coming months, there are a number of factors that we'll pay uh, particularly close attention to, and I'd like to briefly uh, discuss four of these. The first is developments in the global economy. Economic growth in the advanced economies is slowing as restrictive monetary policy has its effect. Even so, labour markets have been surprisingly resilient in many economies, and in uh, many countries, unemployment rates are at multi-decade lows. Headline inflation is declining as the COVID disruptions are overcome, energy prices fall and food prices decline. But concerningly, services price inflation is proving to be very persistent in many economies. As you can see here, it's still above 6% in the United States and 5% in the euro area, and it's proving to be persistent. This persistence reflects strong demand for services and strong growth in wages against the background of weak productivity growth. One source of ongoing uncertainty is how quickly services price inflation globally will moderate and whether the needed moderation here will require further increases in interest rates. It is noteworthy that interest rates are higher in the other English-speaking economies than they are in Australia and in most countries they're expected to go higher still. So they're higher than Australia and they're expected to go higher. The other significant source of uncertainty for the global economy at the moment is the strength of the economic recovery in China. The economic indicators were weak in April after a strong bounce back following the easing of the COVID restrictions late last year. And consistent with the Chinese economy operating with a fair degree of spare capacity at the moment, inflation in China is much lower than it is in the rest of the world. This has implications for Australia, not just in terms of the prices of goods in world markets, but also the prices of our resource expert, ex, exports, which have declined recently, reflecting the slowdown in the Chinese economy. The second consideration that the board's giving close attention to is the strength of household spending domestically. In aggregate, growth in spending has slowed since the middle of last year as the pandemic bounce back faded and the effects of both higher interest rates and the cost of living pressures began to bite on household finances. We expect that consumption growth will remain subdued for some time, largely for these same reasons, although stronger population growth is going to provide a bit of an offset to this. There is, though, quite a lot of uncertainty about the outlook for consumption at the moment, given the large number of factors influencing household finances and spending. Some of these factors are shown in this next chart. Employment's been rising very strongly. People have been getting more hours of work and normal income growth has been strong. These are all positives. In contrast, the uh, real incomes have declined and the required mortgage payments as a share of uh, household disposable income will reach a record high later this year. Many households are transitioning from fixed rate loans over the next few months and they will experience the same increase in repayments that has occurred for people on variable rate borrowers. Rents are also increasing quickly and that's putting pressure on many people's uh, finances. Another complicated, uh, complicating element is the very mixed experience across households and firms. Retail spending on goods has been weak, as you can see, but spending on many services has been firm. And the data that the banks share with us suggests that spending is most subdued amongst households with a mortgage especially those who borrowed a lot relative to their income in the last few years, and it's also quite weak with, uh, 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 spending's quite weak for people who rent. At the same time, other households accumulated large additional savings during the pandemic, and there's little evidence that they've run these savings pools down. But other households have very limited savings and very, finan uh, very small financial buffers. And one of the other indicators uh, that we're monitoring very closely is mortgage arrears. You can see that uh, in the bottom corner there. Mortgage arrears remain very low, although they have increased a little uh, recently. Banks are reporting to us that their customers are managing to make the higher mortgage payments, although they have had to come cut back on, on some spending. So it's a pretty complicated picture at the moment, and given the importance of household spending to the economy, the board will be paying very close attention 
to all these indicators at its upcoming meetings. A third consideration that the board is paying close attention to is the rate of growth in unit labour costs. That's the difference between growth in nominal labour costs and productivity. This is because over time, there is a close relationship between inflation and the rate of growth in unit labour costs. As you can see in this chart, over the entire inflation targeting period, the cumulative increase in the CPI has been closely matched by that in unit labour costs. Though, as you can see, there have been some periods of divergence. In the very recent times, unit labour costs have been increasing very quickly. In 2022, they rose by 7.5%, which is one of the largest annual increases over the entire inflation targeting period. Well, the causation between unit labour costs and inflation runs both ways. Ongoing strong growth in unit labour costs would underpin ongoing high inflation outcomes in Australia. Now, the best way to achieve a moderation in growth in unit labour costs is through stronger productivity growth, which would also underpin durable increases in real wages and our national wealth, and would make more resources available to fund the public services that we all value. Unfortunately, growth in productivity has been weak over recent times. Indeed, as you can see here, the level of output per hour worked in Australia today is the same as it was in late 2019. Over those uh, three and a bit years, there's been no net growth in labour productivity in Australia. Now, the reasons for this are complicated and they're not well understood. Productivity growth was slowing before the pandemic, and it's entirely possible that the disruptions caused by the pandemic made things worse. Many firms had to focus on survival rather than growing their business. Supply chains were interrupted. Some firms uh, hoarded labour, other firms found it was hard to get labour. Investment was delayed and finance tightened up. None of these things were helpful for productivity growth. Offsetting this, there was innovation as firms found new ways of working during the pandemic. I think it's unlikely that the innovations in this front were, un were enough to offset the detrimental effects of COVID uh, on productivity from these other uh, channels that I just spoke about. The uncertainty here is what comes next. It's certainly possible that with the pandemic now behind us, productivity growth will pick up. Advances in science and technology will help. Increased digitisation and the use of artificial intelligence offer the prospect of stronger productivity growth. So too could further improvements in the way that services are delivered in Australia, as well as reforms to public policy. But there is considerable uncertainty here. What's critical are the trends over time, not the outcomes from quarter to quarter. At the aggregate level, wages growth is still consistent with inflation returning to target, provided that trend productivity growth picks up. Given the importance of this issue and the increased risks on this front, the board will continue to pay close attention to trends in productivity growth and their implications for the sustainable rate of growth in nominal wages in Australia. A fourth important consideration is inflation expectations. As I discussed earlier, if people expect inflation to stay high, then it's likely to stay high. Firms will adjust their pricing behaviour and workers will seek bigger pay rises to compensate for, them for the higher ongoing inflation. Currently, measures of inflation expectation derived from financial market prices are around the middle of the 2 to 3% target range, as you can see here. And the same is true for professional forecasters. This suggests that financial market participants and economists expect that the RBA board will be successful in containing inflation, in containing inflation over the years ahead. That's welcome. Measures of in expected medium-term inflation uh, for price and wage setters are unfortunately more difficult to obtain. 
One measure that we have is from a survey of union, offic union officials that the RBA has run for a number of years, where we ask union officials for their expected inflation rate over the next five to 10 years and showing the results of that survey in this chart. As you can see, this measure of inflation expectations has increased significantly after it was very low for a number of years, although it's at a level that was uh, common before the pandemic when inflation averaged close to the target, uh, the midpoint of the target. For households, the main data on inflation expectations relate to just the year ahead. We don't have expectations of uh, inflation over the medium term from households. Understandably, given the elevated inflation rate at the moment and the forecast for inflation over the next year, short-term inflation expectations by households are pretty high at the moment. Due to the importance of medium-term inflation expectations remaining contained, the board's going to continue to monitor these and other measures very carefully over the months ahead. Finally, putting all this together, we remain on the narrow path that I spoke about earlier, but there are significant risks. We're particularly attentive to the risk that inflation stays too high for too long. If that happens, expectations will adjust, inflation will persist, interest rates and unemployment will be higher, and the cost of living pressures that Australian families are experiencing will continue. The board is seeking to avoid this. And yesterday's further increase in interest rates provides greater confidence that inflation will come back to target within a reasonable time frame. Now, some further tightening of monetary policy may be required, but that will depend upon how the economy and how inflation evolve. The board will continue to pay close attention to the developments in the global economy, trends in household spending, and the outlook for inflation in the labour market. The board remains resolute in its determination to return inflation to target, and we will do what's necessary to achieve that. Thank you very much for listening this morning, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Phil. Let's grab a seat here. Thanks very much, Phil. We'll take a seat now and we will open the floor up to some questions. And then I know we've got a very keen um, group of journalists that will also like to take some questions. So uh, that was a very comprehensive review, Phil. Let's, uh, let's take it to the table. Okay. Can I go to, uh, can I go to the, the floor to see if there's any questions to start with? Uh, otherwise, I'll kick off myself with some Slido questions. Uh, we do have a roving mic, um, and Philip has kindly agreed to, uh, to take these questions from the floor. Okay, there we've got one. Can we get a microphone to this gentleman here? Just stand up for a moment. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, Mike Hawkins. Um, aren't you fighting a, an uphill battle here with... Uh, Australian governments are spending money with their ears pinned back. Um, if you want to spread the pain a little bit and get the adjustment coming through quicker to get supply and demand in line, surely uh, on the fiscal side they could be doing more. Uh, I addressed this uh, at Senate estimates last week and uh, my summary of the budget was that it was broadly neutral in terms of the inflation outlook. In the short term, it was helping. Uh, the uh, interventions in the energy markets, the price caps and the rebates that the governments are giving uh, some households on their bills will bring inflation down by roughly three quarters of a cent uh, next financial year. So that's, that's helping, um, uh, but broadly fiscal policy is neutral at the moment and uh, monetary policy is uh, restrictive. Another question. Here, if we can get a microphone. Dr. Lowe, Peter Stanton. Um, there's been an assertion in the last few days that giving a pay rise to the lowest paid will have very little effect on inflation. Um, what kind of effect <coughs> would we expect to see from giving a pay rise to the lowest paid? 
Well, it really depends upon how um, widespread the, the, uh, the larger pay rises are. Uh, it's perfectly understandable for the lowest paid workers in the, the um, country to be compensated for inflation. It's, it's, you know, it's tough and we know it's tough. Uh, so that's perfectly understandable. Uh, we will get ourselves though into trouble if we accept the premise that all workers need to be compensated for inflation. Because if you accept that premise, then inflation is 7%, wage rises match that. What do you think inflation will be next year? You know, it'll be high again, and then you'll have to have high wage increases again. So uh, we're in a difficult position where the society, understandably, wants to protect the lowest paid workers, but we've got to make sure that uh, the higher inflation doesn't translate into higher wage outcomes for everybody, because if that happens, the inflation persists and we'll be in the world that I spoke about uh, before that we're really trying to avoid. So it's a really tricky balancing act we're trying to manage at the moment. Got a question up the back. Hello, uh, Sean Tuckerton right. from the ABC. Uh, the Reserve Bank undertook modelling that showed around 15% of mortgage borrowers face negative cash flows at a cash rate of 3.75%. We're now at 4.1%. How much further do you think interest rates can rise before we see a serious rise in mortgage arrears for sales and defaults? Uh, those calculations that you referred to were based on the assumption that people made no adjustments. So if uh, people can cut back spending or in some, some cases find additional hours of work, that would put them back into a positive cash flow position. Uh, that's not to say that there's not very significant uh, stress out there in uh, households at the moment, but as I showed in the um, chart here, that arrears rates remain low. People are affording to, to uh, pay their mortgages, even as they roll off from ver uh, the fixed rate loans to variable rate loans, the arrears rates remain low, but the banks are telling us, and this is understandable, that people are having to cut back in spending. And I think that's going to be the, the uh, environment we're operating in a while, for, for a while yet. People will make their mortgage payments, but they have to cut, they'll be cutting back spending in other areas. Oh. In our session earlier, Philip, we had uh, Dr. Dr. Richard Clarita, who I know you know from his time on the Federal Reserve and now at PIMCO. I think he's coming out here shortly. Uh, at the latter part of his presentation discussion this morning, they talked about, uh, well, the question came from our own global economist, Seth Carpenter, have they thought about a range uh, for inflation in the US? They've got a single point at the moment, which is circa 2%. They've talked about it. To Australia, the target range of 2 to 3%, given that inflation is clearly not transitory uh, at the moment, and it seems to be sort of stuck uh, well above that range, has there, been, has there been any thought given to that 2 to 3% range as being sort of the appropriate range given that backdrop? That issue was examined in the recent review of the, the RBA conducted by an independent panel, and they concluded strongly that... Uh, the two to three percent target's the right target for Australia. Uh, we've long had a flexible uh, inflation target, and I think that's served the country well. Yep. Inflation moves up and down, but I, we really want people to be confident that when it's away from that target range, it will come back. Yep. We're not kind of specific about kind of needs to come back to an exact number, but we want you to be confident, we want the community to be confident that it will come back to average two point something. Yep. Yep. And I think that's the right framework for Australia. Yeah. And you've been very clear in your messaging that uh, it's your, your resolve and the board's resolve to, to get inflation back into that that's, that's our job to do it because, as I said in my prepared remarks, if inflation stays high, we're going to feel a lot of pain. The whole community will hurt. Uh, you know, inflation's corrosive and it hurts people on low incomes the most. Yeah. So we've got to get inflation back down and I know that it is difficult in the short run but what we talked about at our board meeting yesterday is if we were to avoid this difficulty in the short run, we will have a lot of pain in the medium term and that will end up being more costly for us all. So I know it's difficult, uh, but we need to get inflation back down and we're really committed to doing that. And yesterday's decision uh, demonstrates that. Yeah. 
Yeah, terrific. Can I open it up to the uh, to the floor again for some questions? There's one over here. Yeah, Governor, yeah, <coughs> Governor Neil Muston, uh, two questions, please. Um, why has it taken so long to realise that three handle is ineffective against uh, six to eight percent inflation when <coughs> the evidence offshore from uh, central banks who have been on the job um, fighting inflation far earlier is 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 at much higher rates than needed, um, and also they've had better success. And secondly, um, with uh, the quantitative easing that we were doing an unconventional policy. Um, is it, did you feel that the, the harm caused by that and the inefficiencies in the market have really been worth it um, in, in the long term effects and do you feel that the bank might be better off uh, operating with a more conventional structure and say at 1% uh, floor in, in rates maybe hand back to, the, to fiscal measures and hand back to the government? Now, there are a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> the first one, kind of why, why are our interest rates lower than the rest of the world? I mean, there, there, are, there are a few um, considerations. The first is that we had been prepared to um, have a, a slightly slower glide path back to the inflation target than some other countries, because we really wanted to lock in, if we could, this once in a generation improvement in the labour market. So our inflation forecasts have inflation returning to the top of the target band in mid-25. Other countries were getting there earlier, and we were, we were comfortable with that. Uh, so that was one, one factor. Um, another factor was um, that Australians pay, most, of them, most Australians have variable rate mortgages. I mean, in the United States, when interest rates go up, if you've got an existing mortgage, you don't pay any more. In Australia, you pay more kind of within a week or two. So we've had a, in Australia, a very big um, hit to household disposable income from higher mortgage rates. That doesn't happen in other countries. So that's um, one reason we think that interest rates perhaps don't need to go up um, as much as they do elsewhere. And the third factor has been that uh, nominal wage growth in Australia was lower than it was in most other countries. Measures of wages in the US and the UK have been running at close to five. They're lower here. So they're, they're the three um, factors that have um, led us to um, have lower interest rates than the rest of the world. And if any of those factors change, then we would have to reconsider. Uh, you asked about uh, use of um, quantitative easing or maybe perhaps quantitative tightening. Now, um, it's clear in retrospect that the central banks and the fiscal authorities did too much during the pandemic. I think that's pretty clear. But I just, in, when, when uh, you think about that, I just invite you to go back to those days of the pandemic. It was scary. We did what we thought was the right thing at the right time with the information that we had. We wanted to do everything that we could to protect the country from the economic effects of the pandemic. Uh, we did that and at the time we were doing that we thought a vaccine would take years to be developed, the restrictions would last for ages and it turned out the scientists developed vaccines in record time. We all got vaccinated and life returned to normal more quickly than any of us, or at least certainly I expected, and that was the advice that we were getting as well, to take ages. So we did what we thought was necessary. In retrospect, we did too much. Um, now, um, with interest rates away from the lower bound, our view is that interest rates remain the tool for monetary policy and um, quantitative tightening isn't really an effective monetary policy tool when you can use interest rates. So the focus for us is very much on the cash rate. Right, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the floor? We've got another one over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lowe Breckless from uh, Commonwealth Bank Treasury. Just, uh, just picking up on, on that last question from Neil. Uh, when we look at what's been happening with, the, with this hike, we, we had the pass in April and then we've had a May and June increase. You sort of relayed the message in April that you wanted to slow down the pace of rate hikes, and that was sort of well accepted by the market. And now we've gone back to a, an accelerated path of, path of rate hikes. Is that uh, putting together what you've been telling us today and, and in the releases? Is that because you've become more concerned about the wage measures? Um, you put a lot of emphasis on unit labour costs uh, running at 7%, which is now in line with service inflation, so it looks a lot more like the rest of the world. So we're starting to look at least concerned about looking like the rest of the world. And is it also the case that the board is uh, less tolerant of 
any slippage on getting back to three and a half, or to three percent. So three percent by mid 25 was the forecast. Is the board now less tolerant of taking that risk of taking so long compared to what, what what's happening in the rest of the world? And there hasn't been any shift in our tolerance. Um, that, that's uh, you know we, we want to get inflation back to target within a couple of years, and that that hasn't changed. What has changed over the uh, past couple of months is our assessment of the risks. And I, it's not just the wages data. The inflation um, uh, read for April was higher than expected. We've seen housing prices rising again when we thought they'd still be falling. And when we look overseas, we see a lot of persistence in services price inflation, largely again because unit labour costs are rising quickly. And there's been a lot of uh, a strong correlation between inflation developments abroad and what happens in Australia. So. Upside surprises on inflation, upside surprises on wages, upside surprises on housing prices, upside surprises on inflation overseas. We felt like we couldn't just sit idly and say, well, this is just all accidental, it's all just noise. The conclusion we reached was that this represents upside risk to the inflation outlook in Australia. We have been prepared to be patient in getting inflation back to target, but our patience has a limit and the risks are starting to test that limit. So we thought we needed um, to respond after holding steady in, in April. Yep, we've got another question out here. Thank you. Good morning, Dr Lowe. Daniel Sutton from Channel 10. Um, every month that you make your decision on rates, everyone is very keen to express their view about what you've been doing. And I know your comments about budget and existing policy, but I'm wondering, given it's the only lever you can pull, what's your view about what levers government can be pulling in addition to what they're already doing to help bring down inflation? I'm talking about new policy, additional things they can do to help you. Um, the government doesn't advise me on interest rates, so I don't like advising them um, <laughs> on what they should do. I think that's a good division of responsibility, but uh, um, a couple of additional observations I'd make. One is about the productivity reform agenda. We, we really need to focus on that, because if we're going to have nominal wage growth of 35 to 4%, then we need to have productivity growth of 1% a year. We're not generating that at the moment. So that's... Uh, not fully within the hands of uh, government because business has an uh, important role um, to play as well. So that's one area to focus on. Uh, the related area is um, the sustainable rate of growth in nominal wages, which is very much, you know, we want to, we want to deliver 2.5% inflation for you over time and hopefully the country can deliver some productivity growth. So the sustainable rate of growth of nominal wages is equal to 2.5% plus whatever productivity growth we can deliver. So we have to face into that reality as a, as a, as a country. And um, faster growth in nominal wages uh, can only be supported by faster growth in productivity. Dr Lowe, Jim, Jim Jarmus certainly sounded like he was making some comments yesterday in relation to your decision. Uh, how do you respond to what he said in Canberra yesterday? Um, not going to respond to kind of particular uh, comments he makes. Uh, he, he um, like me, want to get on top of got, get on top of inflation. So you know, we have to do that, and uh, the board of the Reserve Bank is strongly committed to it. I think we can still do it with uh, preserving the gains in the labour market, or at least some of them. But uh, if inflation stays high for too long, then we won't be able to. So that's, the, that's the, the path we're trying to navigate and the government understands that. Yeah, I don't think any, any of us died a shock once we saw the, uh, the Fair Wage Commission uh, come out with a 5.75% uh, wage increase late last week that, uh, that we got an interest rate increase yesterday and I'm sure there were many other factors that were taken into it. Yes, yeah, so can I just, there are many other factors. That was yeah. just one factor, as I said. The, and I think it's important because it's not, it's not like we're just responding to the Fair Work Commission. We, sure. We've seen developments overseas, the domestic inflation data, housing prices, the exchange rate, uh, the Fair Work Commission decision, state government wages policies and the federal government wages. So there's a whole bunch of things. And when a whole bunch of things all point to the same direction, it suggests the risks are shifted. And in our risk management framework, we, we respond to that.
Yeah, that's that's our frame of reference. Yeah, we saw, and we again heard, uh, you know, Richard Clarita referencing back to the inflation in the 70s and the damage that that did. Uh, that's why all central banks are focused on on slaying this inflation dragon, so to speak. Do we have, um, we're getting close to time, but do we have any more questions? Looks like we've got, uh, okay, we'll grab one over here. See if we can get that microphone working. Governor Lowe, Edward Boyd at... <laughs> yeah, can... Take three, take three. Oh. <laughs> Governor Lowe, Edward Boyd at Sky News. Look, you have mentioned the Fair Work Commission's ruling last week. Were you surprised by the increase in the minimum wage, how large it was, and how much is this going to add to the risk of a wage price spiral in Australia over the next few months? Uh, it was higher than we had factored into our forecasts, as I um, said in my prepared remarks. Uh, how much it adds to the inflation outcomes really depends upon whether it spreads across other parts of the labour market. Uh, the, the share of the labour force that's covered by the award increases um, is still fairly small. Uh, the concern would arise if the five and a three quarter percent increase became a benchmark or a quasi benchmark for um, outcomes in uh, private sector wages more broadly. Um, I'm really hopeful um, that doesn't happen. And the big increase last year didn't become a benchmark for, uh, for other increases. So we have some experience here, but the longer these big increases go on, um, the harder it will be for uh, wage outcomes in negotiated agreements to stay where they are. So. It's a risk factor we're, we're monitoring. Um, and um, as I said before, the solution here is stronger productivity growth to underpin big increases in nominal wages. We have a question down the front here, if we can. Can we get a mic to this gentleman just here? Just, oh, sorry, we've got, let, let's go with this question and then can we bring a mic uh, up to this front table afterwards? Thank you. Um, what, what things could go, could go right. When uh, Dr. Clarida was speaking before, he, uh, he referenced the fall in American productivity uh, down 3%, a figure that he, he seemed to indicate he just did not believe. I'm just curious as to whether or not the productivity numbers that you have referenced in your talk today could be understating uh, Australian productivity and we could be seeing a, we, could, we may see a rapid increase in productivity and the effect that that would have on, uh, on the inflation interest rate outlook. We might, but can I just take issue with your first comment, a lot of things are going wrong. A lot of things are going right in this country. Now we've got the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, highest share of people who are lucky, lucky enough to live in Australia have a job than ever before. Youth unemployment's the lowest in decades. Uh, commodity prices are very high. Our terms of trade are basically the highest in 150 years. And our public finances well, we've got kind of medium term issues, at the, right at the moment, they're in pretty good shape. And that's a pretty good collection of facts. Oh. And I think we can kind of forget that. Uh, so we've got a, you know, the country's got a very good base um, to work from and um, the, the current rate of aggregate wage growth is consistent with inflation return to target provided productivity growth picks up. So that's, a lot of countries in the world would, um, would like that set of characteristics and we're there and I think we can still navigate our way back to two to three percent inflation while keeping the gains in the labour market. So now a lot of things actually um, are going right. I know it's tough for people at the moment um, and that's the inevitable result of the pandemic and Russia's terrible invasion of Ukraine and that has an, those two things have an effect on us all but there is a path back to um, better times and increasing real wages and on productivity growth, I'm hopeful it, it again picks up. And I think the pandemic really had a disruptive effect on businesses. I know even at the Reserve Bank, how we had to slow down investment, it was disruptive and we couldn't hire people and it kind of affected us and every business is the same. So um, I'm hopeful, but um, we shouldn't fall into a state of despair. Australia's got a great economy, got great people, fantastic prospects, People want to come here, they want to come and live 
and work here and prosper here. No, we're lucky. And I think we've got to, got to remember that. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, um, Philip, because, you know, what we are coming from is a set of interest rates that not just in Australia but globally were set for a pandemic that you know, many, in fact most, had never experienced in their life across the globe. So we've gone from emergency settings at point one, the normalisation is going to cause pain and disruption yeah, right around the world. So, you know, it is the theme of this summit, disruption, and I think, you know, the interest rate cycle is no different to that. Yep. Um, I'm one of the older ones in this room that uh, can remember when we had 17% mortgages um, back in the uh, early to mid 80s. So, you know, normalising to an interest rate of 4% doesn't cause me a great deal of uh, concern from a long-term perspective. These are still very relatively low interest rates, so I think your optimism yeah. is... But I mean, I want to kind of also acknowledge the kind of the high inflation, it's hurting people, isn't it? I mean, the price level goes up 7% in a year, that really hurts people, and mortgage rates go up a lot, that, that's hurting people. Yeah. Um, I think if we, um, and I'm hopeful this will be how it plays out, inflation comes down and we can go back to rising real wages again and we can get through this period of um, difficulty. But the, the fundamentals that we have in this country are still pretty positive, yep. very positive. Yep. I think what we're all seeking ultimately is uh, let's get to that peak rate. Uh, from the peak rate, um, then we can start making, I think, very sound uh, investment decisions. <laughs> Do we still have a question? Uh, we've got a, just this chap uh, here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you talked a lot today about um, if inflation remains for a period of time or becoming better than expectations so, and, in, and the narrow path. So how, if, uh, what are the risks you guys consider um, being that the interest rate tool that you have um, can, won't be effective across the board, given the wealth in boomers and the demand is coming from a lot of people that interest rate increases don't necessarily affect. Um, given you're across all the data, does, it, does, it, does interest rates hit enough of the population to be able to stifle the demand to bring the, um, to, 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 to get the results that you want in inflation? And I guess secondly, just linked to that is, um, given the increases in productivity you've said are required, what period of time would the RBA look? Because that's not like May data productivity went up, so we're okay. So how, how long for a period of time do you need that sustained? Uh, if I take the, the first issue um, first, the, it's clear that the higher interest rates are causing consumption growth to slow. We can see that in retail spending and we'll, the national accounts come out uh, in an hour or so, so we'll see evidence of that, I um, assume, as well. But I think it's... You've got to be careful not to think that the whole effect of monetary policy works through the mortgage channel. Remember what I said earlier that in the United States, when the Fed raises rates, people with an existing mortgage don't pay any more. Yet monetary policy, in the end, works pretty much the same in the United States as it does in Australia. So there are a lot of other channels through which it works, through the exchange rate, through affecting expectations, through expectations, the availability of credit and the investment outlook. So, in Australia, understandably, the f focus of uh, everyone's discussion is the mortgage channel, but there are a lot of other channels that are working out there and uh, affecting both economic activity and inflation as well. So I think the monetary policy response is working and uh, the uh, effect that people on, that have mortgage, that, uh, the effect is most acute for people who have mortgages, isn't it? And that's, that's really tough at the moment. So we've got a more concentrated effect than in other countries, but the aggregate effect, um, it's, it's working as it is elsewhere around the world. No, this, the, so this, the, the strong growth in services prices, I think, is linked to strong growth in unit labour costs, and we're seeing this you know, in every advanced economy, strong growth in nominal wages, weak productivity growth, that has to manifest itself in large price increases. And we're um, ex no different from, from other countries around the world there. So, yeah. Okay, we are, um, unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time and it's been extremely generous uh, Philip, that you took the opportunity to, enjoy us, to join us, particularly after yesterday's meeting. Um, 
we all recognise that uh, you and the Reserve Board have one of the most difficult jobs in the current environment we, as we are seeking to normalise rates. So uh, we do appreciate the thought and effort that goes into it. Um, and uh, can you please join me in thanking our Reserve Bank Governor, Philip Lowe. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take Hey, we're going to take a short break now uh, and there'll be some morning tea. Have a stretch your legs, a toilet break and some refreshments. Thank you.